Hey, good morning. I'm Scott, and uh, glad you're here today. We are wrapping up this Courageous Killer series. Uh, some of you just realized that today I do wear glasses. Uh, I've worn contacts or glasses uh, since I was 15, so like the last eight years, so, or, or tw <laughs> 23. 23-ish years. I've worn them for a long time. And I still remember the, the very first time where I was at the Costco uh, uh, Optical Center. You know, you remember the old Costco location downtown? It was that place. And so I remember getting the corrective lenses put in my eyeballs. And it was pretty good in the room. I'm nearsighted, so I can see up close fine. It was pretty good in the room. But I remember stepping out. And you know how big Costco's are. I saw all the way to the back. Like, I could read the signs in the back of the building. And uh, things were crystal clear. I'm like, oh, that's what it looks like, right? You know, it's like it became clear. I didn't realize how how uh, fuzzy things were like far off from me. And uh, it was the start of basketball, high school basketball season. So I went from uh, kind of a blind guy riding the bench to the guy who could see a little bit more clearly riding the bench. So <laughs> I was like, oh, that's why I'm not playing. I got it now. Awesome. How many of you wear like corrective lenses, contacts, glasses of some kind? Wow, wow, a lot of you. How many of you should be and you're not, you know? <laughs> like you squint, right? You squint, you're like, I can see to drive, it's fine. <laughs> okay, anyways, that's a whole public service announcement. But today we're gonna talk about one of the <laughs> things in life that can kill our courage is our nearsightedness. Our nearsightedness. We all have a tendency to be nearsighted at times, not talking uh, glasses and contacts here, but all of us can be nearsighted. And nearsighted is simply this, that you can only see, or I can only see, clearly see what's right in front of me. That if I take my glasses off, I still see people. I still see your objects right there. But if I was to try to read, like, read your face, like, it's hard for me. But as soon as I, you know, I can, I can read just fine. I can see without my glasses up close just fine. But we all have this tendency to only in life Look at the things that are right in front of us because we can see those more clearly. And, and, and we, could, we have a harder time seeing the future. We have a harder time like seeing what could be in our lives. We have a harder time seeing down the road of things that should be different in our lives. Like here's, a, here's, a, here's something to try, right? Public service announcement, don't try this. Here's something to try. As you're driving home today, if you're the driver, just stare at your dash all the way home. Okay, your hood. Just stare at your hood, nothing else. Just live life only looking as three feet in front of you. Just stare at your hood the entire way home, right? I mean, it's silly, it's crazy, it's stupid. Like one of the first things we learn as driving is like look far out ahead. You'll drive more accurately, you know, straight. You'll, you won't run into objects. The worst thing you can do if you're driving or like riding your bicycle and there's a rock or a hole and you stare right at it, what happens? You hit it. Right? As soon as you look at it, you hit it. You're like, I'm not trying to hit that. And, oh, I hit it. Like, how did that happen? It's one of those things in our lives that if we can, you know, only see what's clearly in front of us and we stare at that, that is the dangerous game we play by being nearsighted. And in our lives, if we only take action, if we only take steps in our lives on the things that are super clear to us, and as, if we can only see so far down the road and then it gets fuzzy and I'm not sure and there's uncertainty, a lot of times it has a paralysis to our lives. Our nearsightedness keeps us from taking courageous steps, the steps that God really designed for us to take because we're unable to see clearly down the road. Because the future is fuzzy. It's always fuzzy. It's always going to be fuzzy. And it's then therefore if we feel it's going to be super risky, Right? Like I was talking to one of my good friends this week, and he just kind of had a little bit out of the blue, God's been stirring his heart, but a little bit out of the blue, a major career shift opportunity presented before him. And the future of that is like major for his family and his two kids, and it's super fuzzy for him, and it sounds real risky, and he's at a stage of life, life where you don't necessarily make that kind of a major shift. And, uh, you know, I got this little fun scale for us today to kind of help illustrate. But we, you know, my buddy, he's weighing things out, and if he looks in the... The today scale, right? It's like, oh, what I can see today, I'm just going to put it in front of me. But we look at the future and go, man, the future, I'm not certain. It's risky. It's, it's scary. It's unknown. We talked about this in week one. There's a fear of failure, right? None of us need to raise our hands on how we don't like to fail going forward. None of us like to waste time and energy on something that won't work out. And as we begin to, like, make decisions and, like, I don't know if I should bring that up with that person 
Because today things are okay. Like, I'm not rocking the boat by bringing up that, that conflict we have or that issue that resides in our relationship. For today, everything seems safe and secure, so I'm just going to, that feels comfortable and convenient to me, and I'm just going to not risk it because I have no idea if I bring that up, like how they're going to respond or what's going to happen in the relationship. So it's fuzzy, the future is fuzzy, and therefore it's risky. And it's going to kill our courage if we live only seeing today. Only putting all of our balls in one basket. Future is fuzzy. There's this uh, TV show, The Tonight Show. Have you heard of that? Yeah, you know what I'm talking about? They play this game every week called the hashtag game, and they send out a hashtag, and the people respond. And a few weeks ago, it was this. If I had a superpower... I mean, that's a fun one, right? Like, you think about what you would do if you had a superpower, you hashtag it. So here's what someone put. They said, I'd want the superpower to look into the future when I start any Netflix series and see if I'm satisfied enough at the end of that it's worth the time commitment. <laughs> right? I mean, you had no idea how risky it is to live near sight, and now you understand, like... You're like, ah, I could binge watch all weekend. I just want to know on Monday morning if I'm, like, satisfied with the, like, you don't want to know the outcome of the series. And the de- I just want to know if I'm satisfied inside that I spent all this time and energy because today is what I have and I can see clearly and I'm uncertain of the future, right? And I, I, you know, I know we're joking around. That's funny, but we get it. It's bigger than that. It's with our career and our lives and our families and loving the people around us. Jesus has a full life for each and every one of us that's greater than what you're currently experiencing. And the thing that'll get in your way of taking a courageous, more courageous step into the future that Jesus has for you is, is your nearsightedness, is our nearsightedness. And here's the deal. I know it's tricky with all of this. We keep saying, take a step, take a step, take a step, being courageous, take a courageous step. And we're looking for a plan when Jesus gave us a purpose. It's kind of the tricky part of all of this. We're looking for a plan when Jesus gave you and I and us together a greater purpose in life. Then what I mean by that is we're looking for a plan that's one, two, three. It's a proven path. There's minimal risk. I can see far down the road, and I know the outcome. It's the desired outcome, the desired outcome that I have in my own mind, in my own heart, and I've decided, you know, that that if I take this step, it'll lead to that step. And here in America, this is a really an American thing, and if, if you've ever been outside of our American context or listen to people, interact with people, we really have, a, 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 you know, an adversity to, like, taking a wrong step in America. We don't want to mess up, and we're very goal and driven with, you know, objectives and, and targets, and we don't want to take any step that might lead us off a straight pathway, the most direct and most efficient pathway. It's really an American thing. And then, therefore, we take that to our relationship with God. And so, we're like, God, what's your plan for me? And I don't want to take any of these wrong steps, so i got to make sure I know exactly what step you're... And God's like, time out. I gave you a purpose. Jesus gave us a purpose to be who he created us to be, to be who God created you to be, to love God, to love people. And what you can do within that is, is really a, a lot. And we're looking for a one, two, three plan. This week, the 100th day of our preschool happened. And so it was a fun day and lots of stuff. And so in, in down the hallway and through the lobby here, there was a set of footprints. And the footprints kind of went like this number through the footprints, right? And then they used them to count to 100. And so I saw a couple of the classes and all these kids. And they're like, one, two, 87, 86, you know, and like they're, they're marching and they're following these footsteps. They got their head down. They're just looking at the next step in front of them. They're walking, they're walking. And they wound around, you know what? And then they all followed each other, and then they got to the very end. You know what is at the very end of their step-by-step plan and journey? Anybody guess? Any guesses? Yes, popsicles. (laughs) An ice chest full of popsicles. And I was like, can I get in line too, you know? (laughs) I love popsicles. But we're looking for that kind of plan following Jesus, where it's one through a hundred, clearly laid out. We can always see all the way to the end, and you see, oh, the ice chest, the popsicle's over there, but I just got to wander this way a little bit. And Jesus came, and he gave us a purpose. So I'm going to put this picture up. What do you see here? This is, this is I want some feedback on this. Just, just yell it out. What do you see? Chaos. Did I hear chaos right? Boats. Boat dock. You gotta, you're all mumbling. It's really hard up here. You all sound like this. Money. Money. All right. This is Marina Del Rey. There's like 5,000 plus boats 
This is like one of eight or nine docks like this in this marina. And it's just huge. It's massive. Massive. And you know what this is? This is, this is, this is a bunch of boats waiting for somebody to develop a weekend plan. <laughs> right? Some sort of summer trip. Boats weren't designed to be tied up to a dock. Boats were designed to be cut those cords loose, those ropes loose, and sail. It's, li you know, it's unclear what the ocean's like if you're always tied up to the dock. Like, your life and my life is designed to, like, you know, cut from the dock and set sail. And life isn't super clear. It's kind of fuzzy in the future. But, man, you don't never get clearer sitting on the dock tied up. And what would you do if you could see more clearly into the future? Like, what would you do if you could see more clearly into the future? Because what we don't usually do in the, in the moment, what we don't usually do is we're, we're debating out whether I should bring that up with somebody and talk to them about it, you know, feel safe and like, okay, I don't want to rock the boat and how are they going to respond? Or I don't know, you don't, you're not supposed to switch careers at my age or you're not supposed to do something totally different or going that direction in life seems really risky. What we don't know, really weigh out in the moment is like, what if the relationship gets tremendously better? Like, what if you find a career that maybe, maybe you don't make more money in, but it satisfies your soul in a greater way? You find yourself at more at peace because of the lifestyle you're leading. Like, in the moment, we weigh out the risk and the fear of failure, and like, what if I, what if I, don't, what if I don't succeed, and what if people don't accept me, or people laugh and make fun of me and say, why did you try that, and that was silly? But yet, what if I don't have the opportunity to learn something great? What if I don't have an experience that I get to share with my grandkids of a story of the way I live life? Like, we just don't weigh that out usually in the moment. We always just focus in on our nearsightedness and what's happening today. And we rarely weigh out what's called the opportunity cost, the loss of the opportunity, the loss of the thing of living out the greater purpose. What would you do if you could see the future more clearly? It's one of those questions I think we should wrestle with and not get stuck in. And so we're going to look at a time in Jesus' life with him and his disciples, Matthew 14. If you've got your Bible, you can flip or open up or swipe over. We've got some notes in our, our app. You can follow along as well if you want to. But in, in, in this point in Jesus' life, he's, he's his best, one of his uh, cousins and, and, and uh, uh, acquaintances and friends is John the Baptist, who really led the way for Jesus and said, someone's coming that's greater, it's the Messiah, and he pointed to him and really paved the way for Jesus uh, uh, with the people and getting the people ready. And John the Baptist had just been beheaded. And Jesus hears of the news of his cousin getting killed while in prison. And so Jesus receives that news and like all of us would be, he's got sorrow, and he's got grief, and he's dealing with that. And so he goes away with some of his closest followers to, to take some time to deal with that. And, well, people catch wind of where Jesus went. And so thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people, maybe 10, maybe 15,000 people show up. And they're there, and here's this Jesus who's, whose heart is broken, and he's grieving over the loss of his cousin who died. And then these thousands and thousands of people show up, and they say, we need something from you. And so he sits them down, and he teaches them all day, and then he feeds them. We often call this the feeding of the 5,000. You know, and he fed them, and he had this miraculous moment with his disciples and their faith. And so he spends all day giving, 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 pouring out, pouring out, pouring out. Here's Jesus in a moment of not nearsightedness, but being able to see the future more clearly, not just taking the moment to live selfishly for himself in that grieving moment, but saying, I'm going to do something great for thousands of people that's going to transform things. So he... He paused his grief, and he paused his moment. And then that wraps up the day, and he's like, disciples, you guys go, go get in the boat and go across the lake, and everybody else, go home now, all right? Today's over. So we pick the story up, Matthew 14. This is where Jesus is at. He's had a long day, and immediately after this, Jesus insists that everybody, get, you know, disciples get back in the boat, cross the other side of the lake, while he sent the people home. It goes on. In the next verse, if you follow along here, after sending them home, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. And night fell while he was there alone. And he's going to spend some quality time with his father to deal with his, with his grief, deal with his, uh, you know, his brokenness. Um, let's, go, let's go back to, to the previous verse there. 
to him for a second. And he's doing this for hours and hours and hours. And, and it goes throughout the nighttime and almost all the way till the morning. We'll find out here in a second. But he's taking time to actually deal with death. And it's not something that, that we always like to talk about or think about it, but dealing with death is something that we all encounter and deal with and have and will. And, and, and there's some things that we can do to, uh, to have hope and to have life in the midst of dealing with death. And uh, we're going to actually take the next two weeks and talk about that as a community and hopefully help anybody who's going through it currently. And for all of us, help us to be more prepared uh, with the things of Jesus and have, how do you have hope and how do you have, you know, with a mix of grief and sorrow, but also, you know, how to really talk about uh, life in the midst of death. So we're going to take two weeks and talk about dealing with death. And so I invite you to come back, bring somebody you know that would be uh, really, you know, benefited by the next couple weeks. But this is what Jesus is doing while he's with his father praying taking hours to deal with the death of his friend, I believe. Meanwhile, the disciples are in the boat that Jesus had put them in, and they are far away from the land, and they're in deep trouble, deep trouble. They're like three or four miles out into the lake, and a strong wind had risen, and they were fighting heavy waves. Like they're rowing, and they're rowing, and hours on hours, and on hours, and they're like getting nowhere, and they're fighting this incredible storm. You've been caught in storms before, right? Maybe not on a boat. But you've been caught. Have you, you remember a time where you caught on a storm, like it just started raining or hailing as you're driving? Have you ever been one where you had to pull over because you couldn't see, like the windshield wipers, and you're like, I just keep driving and just hope it's good, you know? <laughs> like, <laughs> right? Because I'm American, I'm fishing, we got to get places, we got things to do. But you've been caught in a storm just out walking or whatever, all of a sudden there's a hailstorm or rainstorm, you got to find some shelter. We were, I was in a boat last year, my brother's boat, and we were on a, on a smaller lake, some winds had picked up, and then the boat just died. And it was like uh, me and my brother and then women and children on the boat, you know. And so we were being blown into the rocks. It was kind of a sketchy situation for a while. Everybody made it out fine, and, and we, we got the boat back to, to the dock fine. But, you know, you've been in a storm, like, and they're far away. They're in deep trouble. And about 3 in the clock in the morning, somewhere in the, the late, late, late morning, you know, early morning, late night, 3 o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them walking on the water. And in another account, Jesus' purpose, he was going to walk and walk right by him. <laughs> like his intention was to walk right by him. And here are these tired men who had obviously, you know, been connected with John the Baptist as well, and their hearts, I'm sure, was some grief, and they spent all day serving thousands of people, and then Jesus said, you get in a boat, and you start rowing all night, right? You kind of feel where they're at emotionally. They've been up for who knows how long, third, you know. 36 hours, 24 hours. They've been up for a long time. I don't know. They're rowing, they're rowing, they're rowing. They're exhausted emotionally, physically. And at 3 o'clock in the morning, Jesus comes walking by them on the water. And the disciples saw him walking on the water. And just like you and I, they were terrified. Right? They were terrified. And in their fear, they cried out, It's a ghost! Let's, let's just be honest. Let's just be honest for a second. When you hear creepy noises at your house, do you get a little terrified? Raise your hand. Just go ahead. Let's be honest. I do. Anybody? All right. You never know. Some of you didn't raise your hand. What is that? Like, you're afraid, like, what's the deal? You never heard a creepy noise, something spooky. You wake up in the middle of the night and you hear something rustling. I don't know. So you get a little nervous. Shotguns. Shotguns, yeah. Uh-huh. You just hope they don't have a bigger gun, right? You know? But here they are in their fear. They cry out, right? When they saw this figure walking on the water in the middle of night, in their exhaustion, in their tiredness, in their emotional drain state, and they have fear. I tell you what, fear is not a thing of God. Fear is never, ever, ever a thing from God. There's an older English word, you know, and sometimes you find in the scripture, we say there's a fear of the Lord. It just means respect. It's not this kind of fear, not a terrified, afraid, nervous fear. There's a respect. Sometimes we, inter, you know, interchange those words. But fear is not from God. Never is from God. So don't, don't fall into this trap as you're taking these courageous steps following Jesus, thinking, well, I should be a little bit fearful. That means it may be from God or something. No, fear is never from God. God gave you a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind, not a spirit of fear. So the spirit that lives inside of you as a Christ follower is a courageous spirit. It's God's spirit. So as you take these steps, as you encounter things along the journey, right, they're following Jesus. Jesus said, get in a boat and go. 
And then into their journey, they're like, we're afraid. It's not from God. So Jesus obviously recognizes this, recognizes the moment. And at once, Jesus said, it's recorded for us here, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid taking your courageous steps. Don't be afraid in following Jesus. He said, take courage. Say that with me. Take courage. One more time, please. Take courage. I am here. Some of you just need to maybe say that like 20 more times on the way home today. As you're looking far out your windshield. Like to take courage. Grab a hold of courage. The Spirit of God who dwelt inside of you. And if you don't know Jesus, he's a relational, personal God who wants to be with you. And you can invite him in, like we were, Ben was saying earlier, by his grace. And to don't be afraid. Jesus is always saying this to people as he's encountering, and us today too as well. It's like you're walking through life and you're encountering things. Don't be afraid. Take courage. What are you facing right now that you need to hear Jesus speak this to you? Because he is. He's saying, I am here. Take courage. Do not be afraid. What are you facing right now? We're not in a boat facing winds, facing the risk of life. But what are you facing in your life and in your relationships with your kids? What are you facing in, in, in a work decision, in a work relationship? What are you facing when you look into the future and it's fuzzy and it feels risky and unsafe and unknown? Like that God would say to you here this morning through his Holy Spirit, don't be afraid, take courage, I am here. And so Peter, in this moment of seeing this ghost type figure, then he hears a voice, he calls out to him, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you walking on the water. Why is this Peter's response? Like you all, you know, if you've, if you've read the Bible, you maybe heard this story, you knew this was coming. Why is this his response, though? Like, is the boat sinking? <laughs> you know, and he's like, hurry, quick, I'm, a, you know, abandoning ship. Like, can I come out? He, is he tired of rowing? He's like, walking on water seems easier than rowing, you know? Why is this Peter's response? Why doesn't he call Jesus to come over to where he is at in his mess and his crisis and what he's going through and say, come over here, Jesus, and be with us and then save us from all of this? Why is Peter's response, I don't really know. I don't really know. My guess is, is, is more of the simplistic maybe. My guess is he sees Jesus and maybe he sees Jesus was on the path to walk by him and he goes, I just want to be with Jesus. So I'm going to go where he's at. So Jesus, can't walk on water, so just call me out there, and then I know this will happen. Maybe Peter just wants to be with Jesus and walking with him, following him. You know, Peter's past looking at the current moment, the current situation, the nearsightedness, and he looks into the future and goes, well, I don't know where Jesus is going, but I'm going to go with him. Because wherever he's going, it's beautiful, it's wonderful, he provides for everything. I just saw him do it to thousands of people, provide them lunch. But he says, Lord, if that's really you, call out, you know, just let, like, tell me to come and I'm jumping out of this boat. I'm throwing a leg over and I'm coming your way. And God's speaking to each and every one of us in this manner, in the sense of we just need to call out to Jesus and see what he has for us. And many of you have done that in your life and are doing that. And a few of you were brave enough to share on a video and we, we captured your video of your courageous step. So I want you to take a look and watch a couple of them. Everybody's step of courage looks different. And here are a few people's stories of their courageous step. Hi, I'm Rachel. And I'm Walker. And I'm Nick. And I started doing the Tuesday Ladies Group. We did a series called Restless, which in that we discovered that God was telling us to sell everything, even our house, and to move onto a boat. And so we're going to see how we can minister to others through this big courageous step. Hi, I'm Jeff. And my courageous step was to ask. Because four years ago, I was a penniless drug addict. I didn't have a job. I didn't have any income. I didn't have any prospects. I spent my last dollar buying someone else a soda. And I wanted to die. And I 
looked up to heaven and I prayed to the Lord and I said, God, if you care about me at all, even the littlest bit, then just show up. Man, any way, anyhow, just show up. And he did. And it's a lot longer story than 30 seconds. But I'm standing here today and I'm delivered, I'm healed, I have hope, and I'm debt free. And it's all because I had the guts to ask. And they showed up. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. <laughs> Just having the courage to say yes. I love that. Nick and Rachel are just saying yes to Jesus, following him, I'm going to sell some stuff, and, you know, probably feels like they're throwing the leg over the boat and saying, I, all right, here we go, you know. And for Jeff just to say yes, just to ask God to show up, and he did, just to have the courage in, in that situation, that point of his life, just to say yes, God, I don't know what the future looks like. It feels risky. It's fuzzy. It's unclear. But I'm going to look past today and my nearsightedness and just say yes because of the potential of like what could be and what should be in my life and the lives of the people around me. And it's as simple as this, and it takes, but yet it takes a tremendous amount of strength and courage that comes from God in order to do that, to follow through and to do what he's saying. It's simple, but it's very demanding. It's clear, but it's very requiring of us when we say yes. And to actually take courage. Like to actually take courage. Jesus isn't just having fluffy words to like, don't be afraid, take courage, I'm here. Like, oh, it's good. No, they actually are taking courage. To have genuine, real courage in their lives. The people we heard, your stories, my story, Peter and the people in the boat and the people around Jesus. When Jesus says take courage, he literally means you can have more courage in your life. It's not just a bumper sticker. It's not a t-shirt. It's literally to take courage. And so Jesus responds to Peter. If Peter cries out, if that's you, Lord, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to go where you're going. I'm going to do what you're doing because you're walking on water. And uh, me and these guys in this boat, I'm not doing so good. And so Jesus responds, yes, come. Yes, come, be with me. You betcha, come on over here and be with me. So Peter throws the leg over the side of the boat in the midst of this crazy storm, this, you know, Tremendous gale force wind, and he walked on the water towards Jesus. Like, that's amazing. That's incredible. There's an opportunity cost there that Peter weighed out. He says, I can sit in this boat and have a story to tell my grandkids about the time where I almost got out of the boat, and I thought about it, but I didn't do anything, and then we all sat in there until Jesus walked over our way, or he weighed it out and says, what if I go out the boat and walk on the water like Jesus is doing? And he, I, th I don't know how much he thought about it in the moment, but he weighed it out. He says, no more of this boat thing. And he threw the leg over. Because sitting in the boat is just nearsightedness. Sitting in the boat is just pure nearsightedness. It's, I can only see the waves and the wind and this ghost and terrifying. I'm afraid. Peter is able to, through the power of the Holy Spirit, I think, just be able to see past all that, see it's Jesus, and have the courage to say, I'm coming out towards you. And have some farsightedness, an ability to see more clearly down the road. It's kind of like this. Like if you're ever in a boat and you just feel that urge to like be like Jesus on the water. You just take, go 40 miles an hour and jump out. Right? No? Anybody? Doesn't this look fun? This is exciting. Now I showed you the real fancy version here. But we've had boats in the past where where you get going 40 miles an hour and there's a pole that goes out the side of the boat, it's called a boom, and you get going 35, 40 miles an hour and then I've thrown my body out of the boat on purpose. You guys want to see that again? It's pretty cool. Go, yeah, yeah, there you thanks Tom. And then you just throw yourself out the body, your body out of the boat and you start barefooting. It's phenomenal. It's so fun. Yeah, this guy's real fit. One foot, one foot, and then just come back in the boat. It's easy, see? It's real easy. <laughs> But it's so amazing. And I've fallen plenty of times on my face and like felt like I broke my neck like 18 times. Like it's great. You got headaches, your whiplash, your neck hurts for days, but it's wonderful. <laughs> right? The boat seems safe and secure and like cushy. You need to jump out of the boat and go for it. Like I know it's fun and I love barefoot and it's great. 
But I tell you what, sometimes you're going to put your leg over the boat and take a courageous step, and it's going to look irresponsible to people. It's going to look foolish. It's going to look silly. It's going to look like, what are you doing? I don't know. That's risky and unknown. And you're like, I, yeah, but we're following Jesus. I don't know. God's saying we go this way. It's, yeah, but what are you going to do when you get there? I don't know. We're not really good with I don't knows, and it's unclear. But I, I tell you this, our nearsightedness will kill our courage. And you may end up with an improved relationship. You may end up with something, doing something great for Jesus. You may end up with a story that you can share and encourage one another. I mean, you weigh out the opportunity that exists. So here's Peter walking on the water, walking on the water, having an awesome time, like living this, this walking on the water in the midst of a crazy storm experience. And then when he saw the strong wind and the waves, he was terrified again. And he began to sink, and he cries out, Save me, Lord, he shouted. So here's, here's Peter walking on the water with his eyes up, looking at where Jesus is, going to be with him. You know, didn't mind the waves and the wind. And at some point along the journey, however far Jesus was out there, he did this number and he looked down. And what happens when you stare at something? That's where you go, right? <laughs> and he looks down and he becomes very nearsighted again all of a sudden in his life. He's on the journey with Jesus, took that courageous step to get out of the boat. Like, I would be the guy in the boat grabbing Peter's coat and go, no, don't do it, man, what are you doing? Like, just get in, like, this is written, why are you doing it? Right? I'd want to think I'm the guy throwing my leg over the boat, but it's like, ah, if you, you know, you go first, and then I'll see how you do, and then I'll be like, <laughs> Jesus, me too, me too. Right? We want a proven path. We want somebody else to do it first, and then we can see if it's good or not. Like, you've got to live the, the, the path that Jesus has for you. And so here, here, all of a sudden, Peter becomes very nearsighted again. He instantly sees just what's right in front of him, what I can see today, and what's clear. What's clear are these wind and this wave, and instantly he begins to sink, and he cries out to God. And I know this can be like the focus of the story a lot of the times. Right? And maybe you kind of associate and connect with the story in this way. You're like, yeah, we walked on water. Great, but he sank. He sank. Yeah, time out. He walked on the water, you know? <laughs> he got out of the boat. Like, he was courageous. He ventured out there. Yeah, yeah, but he sank. Yeah, but time out, right? Like, following Jesus is, is, is a little bit risky, and it's not necessarily clear. He walked on the water. So he cries out, and then Jesus, of course, reaches out for him, right? Like, I don't know, how far did he get? Did he, did he sink slowly? Was it instantaneous? Like, did he start, like, I, I imagine quicksand. Do you imagine quicksand when you read this? You know, or like, I don't think it's instant. I don't know. All right, so Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. You have so little faith, Jesus said. Why did you doubt me? I'd be like, I don't know. I got on the boat, though, Jesus. Like, really? Like, I mean, it was some... <laughs> I had some courageous step. Like, I did, I went for it. But why did you doubt me? The nearsightedness of only seeing the winds and the waves created the doubt. When your eyes get off of Jesus and onto your situation and your circumstances and you quit seeing Jesus, all you're going to have is fear and doubt and depression and anxiety and chaos and disorder and uncertainty. So Jesus says, I'm going to pick you up. And then I, I, it's not super clear, but apparently they walked back on the water together. I don't think they swam. And they got back in the boat together. And then the wind stopped. Like miraculously, you know, just instantaneously. I mean, talk about a courage-building moment. I know he sank for a bit there, but getting out of the boat, walking on the water, and then coming back, and then the winds just quit. This crazy storm they'd been battling for hours and hours and hours and rowing against, and just seemed like it would never end instantly, and just killed the doubt in them and built their courage up, and they took courage because they, re they replied, the disciples were, that were in the boat with everybody now, everybody's in on this next verse is recorded for us, that they just worshiped God, and they said, you really are the Son of God, they exclaimed. As soon as they could see Jesus more clearly, their courage was built up. As soon as they kept their eyes more focused on who he was, their courage was built up. They were able to take courage. 
They began to see more clearly their purpose in life and who Jesus was, right? Their circumstance, they're still out in the boat in the lake there. But as they began to see Jesus more clearly, not their plan or their, their, their next step or what the next 14 steps look like, but then they began to understand more clearly who Jesus was and is, they were more courageous. And seeing Jesus just makes us all more courageous. And I tell you what, the, when you begin to understand that Jesus has got great things for you in the future, when you understand that Jesus has a, a purpose for your life, not just a plan, when you begin to understand that, you begin to take more courage because you can go with Jesus and wherever he's leading. Instead of trying to navigate my own path that goes up and down and around, and then I'm hoping Jesus is with me, and I don't want to make a misstep because then that would be totally off God's plan because he's got a perfect direct plan that's really efficient, and it's a proven plan, and we kind of get in that trap if we're taking courageous steps, and it's, no, if you see Jesus more clearly, he'll, he's already, you're with him, and you're, you're together, and he'll, he'll under, you know, your next step becomes more clear and more clear as you follow him. I tell you what, I was, there's lots of you doing this, and I've heard several different stories in the last few weeks of just taking courageous steps and, um, again, not knowing all the details and just proud, proud of my wife this last couple of weeks. She just took a courageous step with one of our kids and having a conversation, taking it to a next level with them and just kind of nervous about it. Again, the future's a little bit riskier and how they're going to respond and what that conversation's going to be like. And just, just taking taking the step that Jesus would want her to take, and it went great, and it was wonderful, and it opened some doors, and it's going to lead to more wonderful and beautiful things. And, you know, it seemed kind of big and daunting at the moment, but it was just, a, just another layer of a conversation with one of our kids. And everybody's step looks differently, and what God is speaking to you and taking that courageous step looks a little bit differently. And again, we're looking for a plan a lot of times, but Jesus gave you a purpose. You're looking for a plan, but Jesus gave you a purpose. Be who God's created you to be. Love him, love other people. That's our purpose. So saying yes to following Jesus just means loving the people right in front of you. Like, just say yes. Like you heard in the video today. Like, the last couple of weeks, we've heard stories of people just responding, saying yes, being courageous. Things that are, God's put on your heart and how to love people. The people that God surrounded you with, loving them. It may seem risky, uncertain, but I tell you what, go with Jesus. Because he, he is the son of God who can stop the wind and he can walk on water. Or you could be the terrified, afraid person in the boat seeing ghosts. I'm going to go with where Jesus is at. I mean, he demonstrated his power for his disciples so that we could stand here today and take courage with that. I mean, don't mistake the miracle there. He did it for their benefit. He did it for our benefit so he could prove to them, I'm a, I'm a God who is worth being with and following and take those courageous steps in the direction he's headed. So say yes to Jesus and what he's saying to you. Take those courageous steps. Allow God's spirit to empower you and embolden you today to do those things. Quit waiting time, wasting time. Quit waiting for the next thing. Quit waiting for, for something else to happen or when this happens. And there's some things that you know that God needs you, wants you to do for your own health and your own benefit and to love the people around you and just encourage you and challenge you to throw the leg over the side of the boat and start walking on the water towards where Jesus is at. Let me pray for you as we wrap up this morning. Heavenly Father.